A Cow in Krakow by Mini Muriel Dowie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ginny. It was while I was in Krakow, spending my days happily and quietly in wanderings whose vagueness I jealously guarded from the narrowing influences of the guidebook. My excursions had been governed by a principle which holds a vast amount of satisfaction for me. Each morning I had sallied forth and walked to the root of some impressive spire which had seemed to call me, and I could never tell the world of old houses and rich pink brickwork that I delighted in as I went. One spire only puzzled me. Twice I had started for it. Each time I had arrived, hot and interested, quite elsewhere. Needless to say, it gathered an imaginary importance, and I marked it down finally with a sporting eye and started to walk it up scientifically, keeping it well to windward and making use of all available cover. I skirted the somewhat French quarter of the town and passed through the Jewish colony and thence away by a road that seemed aiming for the open country, when at length I recognized my spire, caught in a thicket of big trees, from which grew the long sides of a raspberry-colored building of many windows and a pervading silence. Silence has slept in its courtyard and beneath the empty arches of its doorways. Silence browsed with the brown cow in the center of its grass plot. In all the rooms and ways of it, nothing was stirring. And yet it did not seem dead. On the contrary, windows were open, and curtains not a fortnight starched fluttered at its sills. My intrusion, for I intruded quite promptly, excited no attention, unless perhaps the cow noticed me. I surveyed the two stories on three sides of me, and the tower and the trees, and I could come to no conclusion, if it were a nunnery, which might account for the tower. Why had it not the traditional high wall all round it? Why was it open to the little byway and gate through which I had approached? Where was the surly porter who, through a grating, should have kept the world at bay? Now, I do not need anyone to tell me that my next act was inexcusable. I know this, but perhaps it was justified. However, you are to hear and can judge. I walked in at one of those doorways, choosing, for preference, one through which a sunbeam was preceding me, and I set a resolute but reasoning foot upon the stairway. It was thus I reasoned. The worst that could happen to me would be to be turned out, which would not be injurious, and the best that could happen to me would be to discover my whereabouts and perhaps have an amusing conversation with an inmate. At the best, I could apologize with such wit and grace as the moment vouchsafed me. At the worst, I could but appear a stupid and intrusive foreigner. It was in this philosophic spirit that I ascended two flights of stairs and turned with a degree of deprecation along a flagged corridor, but it was not exactly in this spirit that I found myself opposite an open door and regarding a young man shaving himself before a glass, a young man attired in a more surprising costume than I have ever happened to imagine. He did not see me. It was his profile that I was regarding, and my eye traveled from the cheek he was elaborately scraping to the curious cream woolen and cotton dress which clothed him. Then it struck me that he was some kind of a priest or monk, I was in a monastery. It will not hurt me to admit that a thrill, strange to me since, years before, I depleted a store cupboard of some preserved American limes, flickered and prickled in the nape of my neck and down my spine. It was then that the young man put down his razor, and in turning sideways caught sight of my quite motionless figure. I expect monks are a pretty transcendental kind of people, and perhaps a little exalted in their minds. At any rate, that one treated me with the respectful stare one would lavish on a being from another world. Certainly he did not think I was real, and I do not blame him. To me he appeared a creature in a front scene, I one of the audience, of whom nothing but attention was expected. He began speaking in a tremulous, rapid undertone, in Polish, and I, feeling the situation so absurd and so unreal, laughed and begged him, in French, to forgive my invasion. I felt, in a silly sort of way, that my simple person stood for the outside world, and vanity and folly, and perhaps wickedness, and it amused me and made me wish I knew how to giggle, and could have giggled then. But he wiped the soap from his face with a long, narrow strip of the hardest huckaback toweling I have ever seen, 
which hung by a tag from the wall, and looked at me, still with a rather dazed face, but conciliatory. Madam, are you an apparition? he said gently, and with a smile glimmering through his surprise. I nodded pleasantly. And how is it that... Do you want anything of me? He had altered his phrase, and this second one had in it a note of eagerness that did not chime in with my ideas of the conventual manner. Thank you. I do not know that I want anything now, I replied. I did want to know what this place was, and I came up. Here, the feebleness of my case overcame me, and I did not proceed with my explanations. The young man, however, did not seem to notice any flaws in my remarks. He was rather thinking within himself as he reached a white serge garment from a narrow bed and slipped into it mechanically. I am a stranger. I think I just wanted to be interested, I supplemented. You are the only stranger that has set foot within this building, he said gravely, since I came here, a stranger, fifteen months ago. But there is nothing to prevent anybody coming in that I can see, said I, in defense of my presence. It's all quite open. We are known, the views of our order and its laws in Krakow. No one belonging to this place would pass that first gateway. Wouldn't they indeed, said I, much interested. And why did you come here? The minute I had said it, I felt this remark to be inquisitive, but I must have appeared so inquisitive altogether that a little more or less could not matter, and the young brother in no way resented the inquiry. I came here by a trick, he replied with some fierceness, and I leaned back upon the stonework and blinked at him. The oddness of my position struck me far more forcibly than before, and though he was speaking, even asking me questions, it all went by me as though I watched it in a dream, until at last I woke, and he seemed to be telling me about himself. I was intended for the Austrian diplomatic service, he was saying, and was passing through a course at the University of Paris. I had never had great sympathy with my family, and I disliked the Austrian ideas and influence. I am a Pole, and I love my own country. In Paris I met others of the same mind. I became one of them. We had our dreams, and we hoped. I see now that I abused my father's confidence, but my punishment has been bitter. For ten months I labored secretly, put aside my title, and traveled to Switzerland, to London, lectured and spoke for our cause, and told my family no word of what I was doing. It does not matter, it would not matter if I told you the whole of it now, for I am as dead to the world as if I were in a silver tomb in the vaults of Vavel. But it broke up my life. A lady at whose house I visited in Paris learned something of my pursuits and wrote to my family. I do not say that she meant ill. I was recalled to Vienna to join my father, who has a high position there and is much favored by the emperor. He spoke to me of the ruin of our house, of my mothers and sisters. In spite of his name, he is a modern. He swims with the tide. I was at once offered a post at a court and compelled to mix with men of my father's opinions, and I could not bear it. I promised my father to follow any profession, to enter on any way of life that did not entail my bending my pride so low, my living in a nest of lies, eating them, breathing them, lying down at night with them. Any life, said my father. Any life, I answered. A Chernovitsky never breaks his word, said he. Nor binds himself to false oaths, said I. That was the end. I left my father at his government office, and on my return to the hotel of my brother, a note awaited me. It announced that this. The young man waved his arm in the direction of his narrow bed and single pre was my father's choice for me. For fifteen months I have seen no one belonging to the world, the world I love. No one till you came, mademoiselle. Your chance visit, I think you have dropped from the skies, excites all my old longing for the life I have left. Why not leave this life and go back to Paris? Cut yourself off from your family. You are cut off from them now. And make your own life what you please. The brother smiled and shook his head, looking dreamily into the elm branches that smothered the root of my spire. Do you know Paris, he said wistfully? Well, I have just left there. And you return, he said with sudden eagerness? Oh, in about three months, perhaps. Mademoiselle, you have it in your power to do me the greatest possible service. You comprehend? The greatest possible service. Will you do it? It will not trouble you much. You who have fallen from the clouds to give me comfort. Will you do it? He was extraordinarily excited. His face, which was pale, 
flushed a very dark color, and he panted as he spoke. I stood away from the cold stone balustrade on which I had been leaning during this remarkable interview, and put a foot over the threshold of his cell. But certainly I will do it. I will do anything in my power that will really serve you, I said. Only tell me. A bell, such a nasty, tinny, ascetic, inhuman sort of bell, rang out from the spire. The young man looked nervously towards his window, but began speaking rapidly to me as though time were precious. I left Paris hastily, as you have heard. There was not time to see or explain to all my friends. One of them, Mademoiselle, I am trusting you, and speaking with my soul, and yet even a dead man hesitates to talk of that which is in his heart's lining, so to say. But I have thought so much, and there is no way. My mother, my sisters would not help me, even if I could get word to them. But letters are inspected, and I, sacred God, I am supposed to have given up such thoughts. You cannot mean that you are going to spend all your life here, doing nothing. Oh, do not be so mad. Come away. Come away now. No one saw me enter. None will see you go out. Come, and let me help you back to Paris. I have money if you need it. Let me help you back to, to the lady you have not forgotten. It was a venture, but I never was surer of anything than that lady's existence when I spoke. He stooped with a strange, graceful suddenness and kissed my hand. Dear lady, he said, there is my oath, and the words choked him as he said them. But time is short, let me think. A brother might pass at any moment. I must write a letter, and you, ah, uh, I am afraid it is too hard for you to find her and to deliver it. She may not be in the same place. She may be, no, God is not cruel. She is not married. The simple faith of that man's voice as he said these last words is what I have never heard nor ever expect to hear the like of. I knew very soon I should be crying. Well, won't you write, I said. I will find her. Tell me only your name, I added, with a sudden inspiration, and be quick and write the letter. He had already found his paper and pen. It was a stiff, curious piece of paper, and he was flinging words upon it. I am Stanislav Chernovitsky, Count of the Province of... You are Brother Stanislav of the Order of the White Brothers of Jesus and John, said a voice in the corridor. I have never been so startled in my life as when, with chill, frozen slowness, I turned and saw that white man standing behind me. It was not for myself I was frightened, for nothing could happen to me but the poor Count and his half-written letter. For ten seconds, fifteen perhaps, no one spoke. I admit I had quite lost my head, but it only struck me that all Poles do not know German, and I assumed that the superior did not and that the Count did. For heaven's sake, the address, only the address, I exclaimed, with the stray South German accent of my school days, which recurs to me in moments of excitement. But the Count's hand had fallen to his sides, and the newcomer was addressing him over my head in Polish and with great severity. I knew it was about me, but my wits had not come back to me quite, or I would have behaved with more dignity. I put out my hand for the letter. The name, just the bare name, I said wildly. Ah, oh, no. Go, madam. Pray go, I beg of you. It was the Count speaking with strange, bitter self-possession, and that should have brought me to myself. I turned to the superior. I do not know exactly what I said, but I smiled in my nervousness, actually smiled on the horrid creature who had appeared so inopportunely. Madam, of your goodness, go, and thank you, said the soft voice of the Count behind me. And without a word more I went, down the stairs and out into the court unmolested, and the slamming of one heavy door, that of the Count's cell, I felt sure, was the sound that followed me into the sunshine. End of A Cowl and Krakow by Mini Muriel Dowie